Thanks, Gary. Thanks to the commissioners and the members of the TAC for having me. Um, so consensus mechanisms, it's a, it's a, it's a big looking word. It's not exactly something a lot of people who are more comfortable with financial markets are going to be comfortable discussing necessarily because it comes from the world of computer science. And these are the foundational revolutions behind cryptocurrencies that I'm about to describe. And because of that, it's helpful to start with a, a meme and a little bit of background. Why do we have cryptocurrencies? Why do we have open blockchain networks? What is their purpose? Because their purpose informs the, the mechanisms and the designs of those mechanisms that power them. So just a quick review. Cryptocurrencies en masse, they take centralized services and they turn those services into peer-to-peer -peer internet protocols. So if you think about your email, there's no company that runs that. It's something that is an internet protocol, the simple mail transfer protocol, and it allows you to send an email from one person to another, even though you might use Gmail, she might use Yahoo, he might run his own email server, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend that in Washington, DC. PayPal or Venmo is an example of a centralized internet service that's actually kind of like Twitter or Facebook, which are centralized messaging services as compared to a decentralized email. And PayPal and Venmo are, of course, ways of paying people across the internet. So the goal of cryptocurrencies and open blockchain networks is to do the things that PayPal does, but do them without the company actually running the show. Do them as a peer-to-peer -peer internet protocol. And that's really quite stunning. It's really fantastic. Um, so how does it work? Well, it works with blockchain crypto magic, as we all know which can solve most of the problems that we're all facing in our lives. And what I really mean is it works because of peer-to-peer -peer networks and consensus mechanisms. Now, I'm not going to talk much about peer-to-peer -peer networks today. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, you may think of a hub-and-spoke model of communications, where everyone's kind of talking to a central node, and then they relay the messages outwards to the edges. That is not peer-to-peer -peer networking. Peer-to-peer -peer networking literally means that this computer could potentially, through the internet, form a direct connection with any other computer in this room, and they could all connect to each other and propagate messages through the entire network without relying on any one participant. Consensus mechanisms, however, are the topic of the presentation I'm going to give today, because they're even more complicated in many ways. So just to remind you, and if you've seen me present before, this slide might look familiar. Uh, if we're talking about decentralized applications or decentralized services, money is the simplest one to probably use as an example, but we could talk about identity or file storage or other things. And it basically looks like this. In the normal, traditional centralized paradigm, you've got a company like PayPal that does a bunch of things for its customers or its users, and that's things like checking passwords and login credentials, keeping track of who's paid who, managing their employees to make sure everyone's working together to make this service as good as it could possibly be. Now, how do you take that and take the company out of it and put it into a peer-to-peer -peer network? You basically need to automate those three big services, and that automation is the process of getting every computer to agree on essential data to the service. And that process of getting all those computers across the internet to agree is the process of consensus. So when we talk about consensus mechanisms, we're talking about the actual technology to get all the computers to agree on the sorts of things that PayPal would otherwise be in charge of setting as rote. So what are these things? Well, the first thing to point out is that, of course, this is distributed ledger technology. This is a particular type that uses an open network. And what that means is copies of the data that is essential to the consensus, the data that we're actually trying to reach consensus over, is stored redundantly on computers all over the world. Every computer on the network gets a copy of the ledger. And that's very important and gives us some great and kind of neat resiliency features because unlike having centralized servers, you could imagine one computer being somewhat malicious, hence the horns, or another computer going offline because of some catastrophe or just a loss of electricity, and yet the network as a whole is fine because there's copies of this data stored on hundreds if not thousands or tens of thousands of other computers. Fault tolerance is what we're talking about here. Now another thing to point out is I have a stylized version of a blockchain here or of a block in the blockchain, and you see I've got timestamps. 
Now, the, the, the fact of the matter is we don't actually have a good way of knowing which transaction comes before which transaction if we just have a big, long list of them. And that's because if we were going to actually timestamp each transaction, we'd need to rely on a centralized party to do the timestamping. You know, you'd need to rely on the United States um, government, perhaps, to do the timestamping, or you'd need to rely on a corporation. And that's simply not how we want to build these systems with a single point of failure. So blockchains and open blockchain networks instead, we don't timestamp necessarily every transaction, but we can reach consensus over whether a batch of transactions happened before or after another batch of transactions. And we call these batches blocks in the terminology of cryptocurrency, and they are, of course, blocks in the blockchain. And the reason why we can have all of these computers agree that one block happened before another is that a piece of data from the previous block must be used to build the next block. And really what you're doing is you're taking all that data, that previous block, and running it through a mathematical function called a hash function, and taking the output, the output is is just the answer to the equation, if you will, and putting that output in the next block. And the only way to create that output would have been to have that initial data. So you know that if you see that output in the end of this chain, it must have had the inputs from the previous block, which must have had the inputs from the previous block, which means we know that that block happened after those previous blocks. It's just a really rudimentary way, but a foolproof way of ensuring that we have an order that everyone can agree on. So we run this data through a hash function. And we can actually calibrate the difficulty of how, how expensive in computing cycles and electricity it is to run that hash function. We can make it more or less difficult to suit our needs. And because it's difficult, it gives us another neat little feature. We can have every computer on the network that wants to, to we call it mining, but it's not the best term, mine the blockchain, run that hash function. And the first person to, to solve it, it's sort of like an open-ended math problem, will be the person that the rest of the network will recognize. So again, this is part of finding consensus. The first person to solve the equation will be the, the consensus, uh, the member of the consensus who will be recognized as authoritative for writing the next block. And so this gives us what you can think of as a provably fair lottery. Now, there are other uh, blockchain networks, permissioned blockchain networks or social graph blockchain networks, where the participants are previously identified by a scheme organizer. So we don't need to have this hash function-based provably fair lottery because you could basically have everyone have a name on the network and put their name in a hat, and then you pull the names out. And that's how you go around and pick who's going to make the next block. But these networks are open networks. And we can't trust everyone to put in a name, honestly. So we have to have some other mechanism of setting up this provably fair lottery of who's going to write the next block. Now, another thing about my stylized version of the blockchain, there are no real names in the blockchain like my version here. And the transactions are going to be in the cryptocurrency described by that blockchain. So not dollars and not Vitalik but rather a public key transferring uh, a Bitcoin to another public key. And these public keys are basically the addresses where you get paid, and your private key is something kept on the device that generated the public key that allows you to sign the transactions. And those signatures are what guarantee that the person sending the funds is the person who actually received the funds in the past. They're not trying to send someone else's funds. And who checks all these signatures? Well. Our lucky miner, who was the first to solve the hash function, they're going to announce their winning lottery ticket effectively to the rest of the network. Hey, I solved the function. Check it. Make sure that I'm right. And they're also going to share with the rest of the network the signature data from the transactions in the blockchain. And the, net the network is going to check all of that. And this is what prevents people from double spending, prevents people from putting transactions in the blockchain that would be fraudulent, spending other people's money. Because when this one miner announces this block, they don't have complete power to put whatever they want in that block. It has to obey the rules of the consensus mechanism, which include only transactions with valid signatures. And so everyone else in the network checks those signatures and checks the hash or the work that the miner did. And all of this comes together to form what we call a proof-of-work consensus mechanism, the thing that Bitcoin uses, the thing that Litecoin uses, a whole bunch of other cryptocurrencies. Now, you might ask yourself, why do all this work? 
Well, you get to give yourself a reward, also based on the rules of the protocol. So in Bitcoin right now, you're allowed to give yourself 12.5 new Bitcoins if you win this lottery and form the next block. And you can give that as a transaction to yourself that has no originator. It's the only time you're allowed to send Bitcoins that don't come from somewhere, because this is the money creation feature in that network. And again, if the miner wanted to do something malicious, say give themselves a bigger reward than 2.5 Bitcoins, which is currently the specified number in the protocol, the rest of the network would see that block, check that work, and say, I'm sorry, you can't give yourself that bigger reward. You're breaking the consensus mechanism's rules. And so in this case, the block is fine. And this is why the miner did the, all this work, this computationally expensive, electricity expensive type work. It's because they wanted this reward. And they can also collect fees from transactions in the block. Now, it's important, it's really critical to point out that this is an open consensus mechanism. Again, different from, say, a permissioned blockchain, as I described earlier, where all the participants are identified beforehand, or a social graph consensus mechanism. Um, so what do we have in an open network? We have the possibility of writing the next block on the blockchain. Who can do that? Quite literally, anybody. Anybody who has free software and an internet-connected computer can run this hash function uh, based on the prior data in the blockchain that they can freely download. And if they're lucky, they'll win, and their proposed next block will be the one chosen to be added to the blockchain. And it doesn't matter if this is the first time you've ever turned on your computer and happened to install the software. There's no gatekeeper. There's no one you have to seek permission from. You can mine too now if you want. You can help build the blockchain. And this means that these networks can potentially get very big, hundreds of participants, thousands of participants who are all maintaining the data. And they're open-ended. It can get even bigger. Pe more, more and more people can join, and that just adds to the resiliency of the system. We've got more people checking other people's work. We've got more people so that if one computer goes down, or maybe even a whole country's worth of computers go down, the network is fine. That's pretty revolutionary. And of course, different people, if they think they're really good at this mining thing, might decide to specialize in it, get really good at it, invest more money in their computers that they're going to dedicate to mining. So some participants might be more powerful than others as far as the number of hash functions they can run on their computers at any given time, as represented um, somewhat comically by my moving gears. So what does this mean? It means that sometimes if more people join the network, more computing power is dedicated to the network, the network is speeding up. They can solve these hash functions more rapidly. And that could potentially lead to a problem. Because you can think about the hash function as basically just sort of like sitting and flipping a coin. And you want to get heads up 10 times in a row. Now, if any one of us started doing this, we'd be here for a very long time. But it's an interesting fact from statistics that if every person around the world, all 7 billion, started flipping a coin at this moment, about 1,000 people would get a run of heads up 10 times in a row on their first try. So in other words, more people solving this function, more people performing this action, means you'll get the result you're looking for faster. So blocks would start coming around more rapidly if more people were dedicating computing work to solving these hash functions. And we don't want that. Bitcoin's block times, so the times we want blocks to come around, we want it to average about 10 minutes, a new block every 10 minutes. That's, again, part of the consensus protocol. That's something that, that helps computers agree. If blocks come around too quickly, we run the risk that half the network might start building on one block that the other half of the network hasn't heard of yet because of just the delay in sending a, a, a bunch of data over the internet from, say, North America to China. And this would be a problem if Chinese miners and American miners are mining on different blocks because then you get a divergent history of the world. So we really want to make sure blocks come around more slowly than, than, than as fast as possible, if you will. And so with Bitcoin, the difficulty of the hash function simply adjusts automatically if blocks have been coming around too quickly or too slowly. Basically, it says that, all right, if all the world is flipping coins, there's going to be a 1,000 people in the first try that get it. We just want one person, and we want it to take them about 10 minutes. Now you need to flip a coin and get heads up 20 times in a row or 30 times in a row. Someone will still probably crack it, but it'll take longer. And vice versa, if blocks have been coming around too slowly, we make the problem simpler. Heads up five times in a row instead of 10 times. 
And this is actually a very accurate metaphor. We're not going to get into the actual hash function, but coin flipping and looking for a string of heads instead of tails and, and a mess is really right on target. So that brings me to the next thing I want to talk about, which is in these proof of work consensus mechanisms, uh, what's the mining hardware look like? And what's this term called ASIC resistance that we've heard about from some proof of work consensus mechanisms? So again, this is all just a way primarily of setting up a provably fair lottery to pick who's going to write the next block on the blockchain. And this is actually a quote from the uh, Bitcoin white paper. This is a, a screen grab from Satoshi's white paper describing Bitcoin. And this is a brilliant document. Um, I'd just like to point that out first before I criticize it. This little highlighted bit here says proof of work is essentially one CPU, one vote. That idea that Satoshi had was that this would be a very democratic and an and open system where people running normal looking desktop computers around the world would all be participating somewhat equally. One CPU, like that CPU, one vote. And the reality is a CPU is good at doing just about everything, but it's not great at doing anything specific. It's a general purpose computer. And the bottom line is, once Bitcoin started becoming valuable, people thought, OK, I could do better than this. I could use a more specialized type of computer, and I would be able to solve more of these math equations while using a little bit less electricity per equation. And then I'd be out competing other people who were mining. And so rapidly, we saw the change in Bitcoin miners from desktop computers to sort of these fan-made or hobbyist-made devices that use GPUs or graphics cards. These are the things that, that you're going to want to put in your computer if you want to play Fortnite or you want to play uh, a game. You want to play something that's got a lot of rich graphics in it and you don't want it to run slowly. Now, it turns out the, the chips that are good at rendering those video games are also really good at solving SHA-256. So if you stack a bunch of them on a rack, and this is a shoe rack that we bought at Amazon, uh, this is the Coin Center office. We've got this fun little GPU rig we built a number of years ago. Um, if you stack a bunch of these cards on a rack, you can solve these equations a lot faster than just a normal CPU. And then things got even more specialized. So this is already specialized hardware, but you could buy this at Micro Center or wherever. This is what Bitcoin mining looks today. And this is an ASIC mining farm. This is basically a big server warehouse. And on every one of those racks are a bunch of these which are application-specific integrated circuits. They're chips that are printed, silicon, to do only one thing. They can't play video games. They can't play Microsoft Word. Play Microsoft Word. Sometimes it feels like that when I'm writing papers. Um, all they can do is solve the SHA-256 hashing algorithm, which is that coin flipping procedure, as I described it earlier. And so they're really efficient at doing just that. Now, what does this mean from a consensus mechanism standpoint? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Um, people worry about mining centralization. So this is, of course, not quite Satoshi's vision. Satoshi's vision was a bunch of people with CPUs, desktops, their own computers. And these things are expensive and have to be purpose-built in chip foundries. So what it does mean is that only a handful of people, as compared with before, are going to have the resources and then the inclination to actually mine Bitcoin. So that might be a con. But there's also a pro here. The pro here is that these things are really costly. So if you want to competitively mine Bitcoin, you're going to have to sink a large amount of capital into the computers and the devices that you need in order to run uh, a Bitcoin miner. And you're going to need to pay a lot of electricity to do it. And this is actually a pretty good security feature. It means if somebody wants to attack the network, and they want to obtain a majority of the hashing power on the network so that they're always chosen as the next one to make blocks, they're going to have to dump an incredible amount of money into buying these chips, which can only be manufactured in certain places around the world. And if they tank the price of Bitcoin because they attack the network, which would be the logical outcome, they've just lost their entire investment in the hardware because this hardware doesn't do anything except mine Bitcoin. So there are some neat economic incentives. Now, of course, that wouldn't protect against someone who wasn't economically motivated, who just wanted to attack it for the lulls and had somehow a whole lot of money. Um, but again, we've got pros and we've got cons here. On the, on the topic of 51% attacks generally, I, I just want to say a couple things. So 51% attacks are really not 
a, a logical way to attack a large, well-capitalized cryptocurrency. It'd be much better to just sort of DDoS or spam the computers on the network, although it's pretty resistant to that as well. And that would be a much cheaper attack. And we see that, and it's not actually usually much of a problem in the Bitcoin network. But a 51% attack where you really try and develop and cultivate all that hashing power is just too expensive. It's a tremendous cost. Even Google, if they pointed all of their, their machine learning servers to mine Bitcoin, it's not the right specialized hardware, so they're working at a disadvantage, and they actually just probably wouldn't have enough of it. So even the massive cloud computing companies of the world wouldn't be able to attack Bitcoin, uh, at least as currently specified, unless they have something I don't know about. Now, 51% attacks are a real threat to poorly capitalized or small cryptocurrencies that happen to share a mining algorithm with a larger cryptocurrency. And this has been evidenced recently in the 51% attack on Ethereum Classic, which is a fork of Ethereum. But it's a separate network. And this was a confusing thing for a lot of people in the news. You saw reports, uh, cryptocurrency is not as safe as you thought. 51% attacks, much more possible. The bottom line is they're not any more possible with respect to Bitcoin or even Ethereum. But for a small cryptocurrency like Ethereum Classic, they are a real threat. And here's why. Most people, so Ethereum and Ethereum Classic use the exact same hashing algorithm in order to choose who's going to make the next block. It's different than Bitcoin, though. And so most people who have computers that are good at running that hashing algorithm, they want to mine Ethereum because it's the more widely used network and the tokens are more valuable and you'll get more fees because there's more transactions happening there. So most people are using that hardware to mine Ethereum. But if you're like a middling sized Ethereum miner and you decide, hey, if I switched over to suddenly using my computers to mine Ethereum Classic, which is easy because it's the same type of hardware that's good at that, I'd suddenly be a huge Ethereum Classic miner. So you go from being a small fish in a big pond to being a big fish in a small pond. And that means that for that moment when you switch over your hardware to mine Ethereum Classic, you could potentially have all the hardware necessary to 51% attack that network. But it wouldn't work in reverse. You see what I mean? This is really a question of smaller or more poorly capitalized cryptocurrencies being vulnerable because there's a bunch of miners already hanging out out there who at any moment could join the network and really unbalance the number of persons who are mining. And that brings me uh, mercifully to proof of stake. Proof of stake, of course, came up uh, frequently in the Ethereum RFI, and I, I think the, the questions from, from staff and from the commissioners and from in the RFI in general have been excellent, and it is an important topic, so I want to give you just a base of knowledge again. And we had to start with proof of work because the easiest way to understand proof of stake is really the same. We're still trying to build, with proof of stake systems, a provably fair lottery for picking who is going to be mining the next block or creating the next block in the blockchain. And so the question is, in a proof of stake system, how do you get a lottery ticket in order to have a chance to participate? So of course, in proof of work, your lottery ticket was the calculations your computer was doing. And if, if you solve that calculation, that proof of work function, you have the winning lottery ticket. We don't have these calculations in a proof of stake system. And this is part of the goal, as, as stated by uh, Commissioner Kuntens either, uh, of Ethereum's move to uh, proof of stake is to reduce some of the energy usage of the system. So no calculations. How do we provably fair pick somebody amongst this network to make the next block? And how do we make the lottery ticket costly. Because if it was free, you could just claim to have a million lottery tickets, and you're going to do a lot better than someone who is honest and said they only have one. Um, well, we make the lottery ticket costly because you'll have to sacrifice the time value of money, specifically the time value of cryptocurrency. And what do I mean by that? Well, in order to have a chance to be the miner for the next block, you need to point to the blockchain that you're working on and point to a transaction in the past where you decided to stake or immobilize some amount of cryptocurrency on that blockchain. And so that's a sacrifice. That's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to access this. I'm going to hold it. I'm not going to use it in transactions or, or for other purposes. 
And so that sacrifice is the same sacrifice that, that we would want in a proof of work system where you're sacrificing electricity. Instead, you're just sacrificing accessibility of money or the time value of money. And so if you stake more, so for example, this person staked 95 coins in a block previously, you'll have a little bit more power, just as if you run more computers, you'd have more power in a proof of work system. And so again, the participants are going to be lumpy. Some of them are going to stake more. Some of them are going to stake less. And the probabilities should be provably fair. The more you stake, the better chance you have of winning the lottery. It's like buying a bunch of tickets. And there's still a random function to pick the winner, but you increase your odds if you stake more. And every time the blocks come around in Ethereum, it's only about 10 to 15 seconds as opposed to 10 minutes in Bitcoin, somebody will be chosen as the next block maker based on this provably fair lottery. Now, this does lead to some issues from a um, consensus mechanism design standpoint. Um, I'm not going to go too deep here, but I think you should be aware of them. And they're all probably addressable, but they're issues nonetheless. The big one is the nothing at stake problem in proof of stake consensus mechanisms. And this is uh, hopefully uh, uh, an explanation that you'll be able to follow pretty readily. So take our miner who staked these coins in block negative 200. So I'm changing the blocks to negative numbering from the present. So this is a block 200 blocks ago, um, 1XT03 staked 95 coins and signed so that we know that they're theirs, they're not trying to stake someone else's, with their private key. That's what gives them power on the network, correct? That's what basically is the equivalent of them having gotten power on the network by mining. They've immobilized some coins. Now look at block negative 199. Our same staker has now transferred those 95 coins to someone else on the network, probably not them. So they should rightfully lose their staking power. They'll go from being someone with 95 coin power to someone with less because they're not staking those 95 anymore. But what if they do this? They create 200 blocks from that negative 200 block. And you might think, well, how could they do that? That's a lot of data to create out of thin air. Well, not really. They just have to take a copy of the existing blockchain and then they can remove the transaction where they sent the funds to somebody else. And then they present this to the rest of the network as what they think should be the authoritative copy of the ledger. And remember, they've got 95 staked coins. So depending on how many coins other people have staked, that might make them powerful. That might make them likely to have their version of the blockchain chosen as the authoritative version, rather than the one that involved them transferring the coins away. And that's a kind of an attack. They convinced the rest of the network that they sent their coins away, but then they used their staked coins, which were no longer staked, to have power on the network. Hence this name for this attack, the nothing at stake problem. And it could get even worse. So our miner could basically say, hey, I've got all of these um, wallet addresses that are now empty, but they were only empty after block 200. Before block 200, they had a lot of coins in them, and then I transferred them away. Or maybe I'll even go and buy private keys from people, people who thought that their wallets were empty, because they were, but sometime before block 200, their wallets were full. And so you have those private keys, and you could buy them probably cheap, because why would anybody want to hold on to private keys for a wallet that doesn't have any funds in them anymore? And you could credibly make a transaction where you accumulate all of those wallet addresses, and you sign a message saying, I'm staking 2,000 coins now. Now, in your ver version of the future, you're just staking those. In the real version of the future, <laughs> you gave them up or never controlled them. So basically, this is a way to present to the network that you have a lot more power than you actually do. And that's a problem. Now, this is surmountable. But this is also a real problem. So PeerCoin was the first proof-of-stake consensus mechanism-driven cryptocurrency. And it ran into exactly this problem of the nothing-at-stake problem. And it was attacked. And what they came up with as a, as a stopgap measure was checkpointing. And checkpointing works like this. You say that we're going to regularly, as part of the consensus mechanism, say that this is now um, an established block. We can't have a new proposed blockchain that would reorganize blocks 
earlier than this block. It's just a checkpoint. So this, this block now can't move. And so we put this checkpoint, say, here, and this would invalidate this kind of an attack because this miner went too far backwards in the blockchain in order to provide an alternative history or an alternative future where they're more powerful. And so this prevents this kind of attack where you're able to reach back deep into history and present as more powerful than you actually are. This does lead to a certain question, who does the checkpointing? Um, again, we don't want a centralized party to do the checkpointing. And in Peercoin's original design, when they were faced with this problem, it was literally a checkpoint that was established by a signature from a public-private key pair that was, that was held by the developer of Peercoin, uh, just one person. Um, and so that's not really decentralized. Uh, it, it still was fine because they weren't doing anything malicious, but do we really want to have that single point of failure in the system? In Ethereum's Casper protocol, for example, as proposed, that checkpointing would happen every 100 blocks, which sounds like a long time, but again, Ethereum blocks come around every 10 seconds or so. And it would happen whenever two thirds of the validators in the system all agree on a block then it will be checkpointed. So this raises some interesting implications potentially for uh, market participants, um, having to do with finality of transactions. Uh, and, and, and this hopefully is a payoff where we can start thinking about some of the regulatory implications and really just the implications for market participants and how they can self-police and have good policies inherent to themselves to prevent these kinds of attacks from, from causing uh, losses and things like that. So in a proof of stake system, you may need to wait for transaction finality until the transaction is in a block that's prior to one of these checkpointed blocks, because at that point, it's no longer vulnerable to this kind of nothing at stake type attack. Whereas in a proof of work cryptocurrency, there's no checkpointing. So in theory, the entire Bitcoin blockchain could be rewritten at any moment's notice, but we don't worry about that because merely rewriting two or three blocks would require an astronomical amount of computing power, really. And when you get to five or six blocks, it's just crazy. And so the, the, the rule of thumb here is proof of stake, you're probably going to want to wait until a checkpoint in the consensus mechanism. Proof of work, you're going to wait until a transaction is in a block old enough that the computing effort to recreate the chain since then is cost prohibitive, which on average for Bitcoin, just to give one example, is about six blocks, but every blockchain and every proof of work implementation might be different. And that brings me to my final topic, which I promised to be fairly brief on, which is forks. Um, forks. So consensus mechanisms are designed to prevent forks amongst participants, but they're only designed to prevent forks amongst participants who want to stay together. They love each other. They want to be there. And so under normal conditions where all the people who are using Bitcoin want to stay together, forks and reorganizations can happen briefly because, as I said, maybe the North American networks get out of sync from the Asian networks just because of the lag over the Pacific Ocean for uh, trans, uh, transoceanic cables or things like that on the internet. But they'll resolve quickly. And that's, again, why that's another reason why you might want to wait three or four or five blocks to make sure your transaction's really going to be permanent. You didn't accidentally get stuck in a block that was incorrectly built on by part of the network that got out of sync. That's a pretty surmountable problem. It's not really a, a, real, a, a, a real deal killer. Now, there's another type of fork that people talk about rather than these little hiccup type forks. And this is where a group within the community, so some subset of Bitcoiners, for example, people running the computers, they fundamentally disagree with the rest of the Bitcoin community, the rest of the people running the Bitcoin computers, and they don't want to stay together anymore. So they get a divorce. What they do is they fork. And what they're doing really fundamentally is changing their consensus mechanism rules so that they're no longer compatible with the consensus mechanism rules of the original protocol of the original network. And from that day forward, their computers will only talk to theirs, and Bitcoin's computers, or the original's computers, will only talk to theirs. And this may seem like a, a, a real issue, but it, in this situation, we don't really have a big problem of confusion and a question of whether transactions are going to be final, because in this situation, we now actually have two completely different assets. You have Bitcoin, 
which is the thing on the original version of the chain. And you have this new thing that decided to fork off. And there might be marketing or branding confusion. Is it Bitcoin Classic? Is it Bitcoin uh, Cash? Is it whatever? And eventually, communities will settle on these names. But you really have two distinct assets. And so what's the best approach to that uh, for an institutional participant, for, for a market participant? I'll get to that in a second. Um, so mercifully, I'm now at a sort of uh, roundup uh, part of the presentation. Implications for traders and funds, for market participants. So this proof of stake, proof of work question, how fundamental is it? It's generally not relevant. Um, again, proof of stake is just another way to build a provably fair lottery for block creation. Um, now, yes, it may impact some of the best practices for finality that we'd want to see amongst market participants. So in proof of stake, for example, you may want to look at the consensus mechanism and think, okay, there's checkpointing every 100 blocks in this consensus mechanism. We will wait until a checkpointed uh, block comes around to treat a transaction as final. Versus proof of work, where we're just doing it based on computational infeasibility. We know that a, a reorganization of Bitcoin seven, eight blocks deep is, is literally more computing power than the world has ever seen, three times over. And so we're comfortable with that. And again, there is not necessarily always going to be a hard and fast best rule here. But that's nothing new to market participants. You want best practices. You want them documented before a problem happens. And then you want steps to be taken uh, to address problems as they arise, hopefully based on what you specified your best practices were. And so the takeaway, uh, I think I just said this, institutional participants should have documented procedures for how risks around finality will be mitigated. And they should be specific to the consensus mechanism of the asset that they're trading. But it shouldn't be too hard, really. What about 51% attacks? Not a major risk for well-capitalized cryptocurrencies. Again, there's much easier ways to attack networks like Bitcoin. I'm not saying they're going to be successful, but it would be lunacy to try and attack Bitcoin by buying a bunch of ASICs and becoming a 51% miner. It would just be too expensive. They are a major risk for poorly capitalized cryptocurrencies that share a, kiming, a common mining algorithm with a larger cryptocurrency. So. This is the Ether Classic versus Ether situation. And so the takeaway here is that institutional participants should be wary of poorly capitalized cryptos. And there's thousands of them. There's this long tail of all these so-called alt altcoins out there. And many of them may be based on proof of work, on an algorithm that uses something very similar for hardware as Ethereum or Bitcoin. And in the event of that situation, a couple of Bitcoin or Ethereum miners changing their servers over to mine this little coin it's going to be like opening the floodgates. That person was a minor participant on the Bitcoin network. They are, they are the whole participant of this little network, and they could attack it. So it's something to be aware of with poorly capitalized cryptocurrencies. Uh, forks. This is the last one. So well-specified proof-of-work and proof-of-stake systems may have occasional unintentional forks, um, where briefly, and say, again, East Asia versus North American miners, uh, they get a little out of sync. And that's fairly simple to deal with. You just, again, are going to want to have prudent and well-documented procedures over finality. So because of the fact that sometimes blocks may get out of sync, we're going to make sure that this block is six or seven blocks deep to make sure that the network really has agreed that this is the official block. But when a subset of a community members reach intractable disagreements, as we've seen with Ether and Ether Classic, as we've seen with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, as we've seen in a lot of cryptocurrencies, um, there could be a more permanent fork. And that does have implications for traders and funds, for market participants. But the takeaway is this. Institutional participants should have well-documented procedures, again, that describe how they will determine which fork I always say which fork. I feel like I should be saying which tine of the fork, but that just sounds crazy and weird too. So I'm going to say which fork. So policies and procedures in place to describe which fork they will honor. So if there's a question over which one is the real Bitcoin, in other words, they need to document how are you going to make that determination. It could be any number of things. It could be the amount of proof of work effort dedicated to one versus the other fork. It could be the market price of one versus the other fork. It could be any number of things. But they should be policies that are stated in place. And then they also need policies in place to describe what they will do with any windfalls from the other half of the fork. 
So if your fund was holding a bunch of Bitcoin um, before the Bitcoin Bitcoin cash fork, your fund now also has control of a bunch of Bitcoin cash. Okay. If you're saying we're just going to honor the Bitcoin fork, what happens with all that Bitcoin cash you just got? It, it could be a lot of things. And this is, again, there's no hard and fast best answer here. There just need to be clear policies that protect your, your, your fund participants or your investors or things like that. And it could be Bitcoin cash will be liquidated and reinvested back into the fund in the form of more Bitcoins. That's fine. Or it could be we'll hold both. That's also fine. There just need to be policies about this. And that's all I got. Hopefully, consensus mechanisms are a little bit demystified. Uh, Chris Haymeyer, Haymeyer Trading in Chicago. I, I may have a, a point for you, and I'll, I'll throw this out to Peter. Um, in our uh, crypto trading desk with our counterparties, we do a lot of this uh, KYC AML stuff. You did a beautiful job today of describing blocks and blockchains. It reminded me a little bit of the old days back when I years ago uh, worked in the back office and when the delivery receipts, if you turned them over, were signed by the companies and you could track where the delivery receipt had been. Um, the prospect of know your trade, knowing the history of the block and where it's been and whether a, 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 a trade or a, a, a blockchain, a, a digital asset, uh, has some sort of taint to it. Is that going to be possible for the regulators to track that? And is that a good legal thing to maybe have a look at? So um, the blockchains we've been talking about today, things like Ethereum and Bitcoin, have transparent um, transactions. Uh, there's, there's no attempt to encrypt or obfuscate the information there. The information does not, of course, include human readable names, as I said. But addresses are persistent, and if you can identify somebody as the holder of the private key that matches that address, you can basically look at their full transaction history. It's actually far more public than, say, the movement of cash, even through the correspondent banking system. And that actually is, is probably a design flaw that needs to be amended longer term. Um, you know, Crime fighting is important. Financial surveillance laws like the Bank Secrecy Act are important. But if we're going to rely on these systems for all manner of important financial interactions, we're going to be building a panopticon where people can see every person's transaction. If you, if you learned the, the Bitcoin address of the person in the cubicle next to you, you could, and they were being paid in Bitcoin or something like it, you could watch their, their paychecks coming in. And nobody wants that world. So as the technology moves forward, we're seeing the evolution of cryptocurrencies. We're seeing... Uh, proposals to change Bitcoin uh, to make it more private. We're seeing proposals to develop new cryptocurrencies, and some of them are, are already running, like Zcash and Monero. Uh, and, and these are real fundamental innovations that uh, Coin Center, and of course, we are an advocacy organization, although we represent the freedom to innovate, we don't represent any companies. But we believe that these are fundamental to uh, preserving human rights as we move into a future where machine learning and big data will basically make us always uh, subject to surveillance, whether it's corporate surveillance or the surveillance of a, of a good government like the US or of a, of a not so good government. And so we've recently published a report that describes the level of transparency in some networks and the level of privacy that some newer networks afford users. Uh, and we also uh, delve into why that's important, um, why developing these technologies is on, on mass going to be a good, a good thing. And we have another report that we recently published uh, delving into the constitutional law issues of attempts to regulate, say, software developers of these more private networks as, say, Bank Secrecy Act regulated parties and things like that. Thank you, Alex. Alex Stein, Two Sigma. Before I ask my uh, question of Charles and Catherine, I'd like to uh, back up some of uh, what Peter said. Um, investors need to know that the IP associated with their transactions is confidential. And so in that sense, the design of the Bitcoin ledger raises uh, challenges, problematic challenges associated with being able to implement a strategy and not have uh, it transparent to the whole world to reverse engineer. So there, ironically, is a trade-off there. I don't know that I'm totally on board with um, the need for total anonymity, and that's going to drive my next question um, to the ABA representatives. Did you think, with respect to the underlying cash instruments, about 
how the rule of law and the ability for recourse plays out in these instruments. Obviously, if it's a derivative and it's regulated by the CFTC, the market makers are regulated. But a transaction of Bitcoin or Ethereum, <clears throat> you know, a smart contract, uh, I don't have all of those uh, mechanisms. The short answer is yes, generally, not for purposes of the white paper. Again, that's one of, I think, many issues that would fall under the blockchain modality working group. But I, I know that's a, one of the issues that they've, um, they, we've discussed at, at, um, during the calls of that group. So perhaps more to come. <laughs> I think that's a very important area for the institutionalization of this asset class. Okay, great. I see three more name cards up, so we'll have three more quick questions, and then we will take a break for lunch. So why don't we go from uh, around this this way, counterclockwise, starting with Larry. Hi, Larry Tab Tab Group. Uh, Peter, when you were talking about a proof of stake, nothing at stake, you know, and, and kind of taking a transaction in the past and kind of manipulating it and showing, you know, printing a block that you really shouldn't have access to. Um, if that gets accepted, don't I manipulate the chain and in effect, you know, um, either take or, or remove or add coins onto a block that in effect where I didn't have money now or coins, I now have coins? So, so that, that's the root of the nothing at stake criticism which is that you'd be able to artificially present as having more power than you should because you've gone so far back in the blockchain that you're able to claim as yours staked coins that have since been transferred out of those wallets. And, and, and that's why checkpointing uh, is generally regarded as the right way to build a consensus mechanism that relies on proof of stake because it effectively says once uh, two-thirds of the network, just to take Casper's protocol from Ethereum, as an example, agrees on this block, and we have been 100 blocks since the last checkpoint, it's, it's checkpointed. And so any miner, or staker in this case, who presents an alternative history that goes back further than this block is, um, per se, violating the rules of the consensus mechanism, because we don't allow those deep reorganizations. And um, you know, it, 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 this sounds scary, I suppose. Uh, but I, I, it's not my intent to suggest that proof of stake is, by any necessary um, reality, any more risky than proof of work. It's, these things are somewhat un, underdetermined, but there are running proof of stake cryptocurrencies. Um, so as I said, Ether's transitioning, but there's already running cryptocurrencies that use proof of stake mechanisms that have, to my knowledge, not been attacked. And these are things like Tezos. Um, and I, I could get you a longer list if you're, if you're curious. but. Thanks, but, but how difficult would it be to, like, you know, let's have a checkpoint, do it, you know, have coins, do two transactions, and then, you know, manipulate, like, the third one or the fourth one? Or is that just the, the lottery process would make it that really difficult for me to basically right. sure that, that, so, that I'm going to be the, the third guy to do a transaction after I've sold my coins? Right. So the, the nothing at stake problem arises because you are able to pretend to be an, an outsized important character on the network, basically, because you can claim all of these staked coins that you shouldn't be able to claim because long ago they were transferred out of those wallets. Um, with checkpointing, you couldn't do that except with respect to the most recent blocks, which the pool of coins that you could claim to stake and then transfer away ends up being much, much smaller, effectively. Um, it's all a game theoretical design. Uh, but these these are surmountable problems, and I think we're seeing really brilliant people surmount them. Um, Jaime Werke from FINRA. Um, I, this question is also for Peter. Uh, regarding the 51% attack, you mentioned that the higher the capitalization of the digital assets, the less likely it is to be subject to a 51% attack. Does that relate to the concentration of miners that would exist within the context of that digital assets? And, and if it does, is there a concern as there is increased levels of concentration, those problems could start creeping up within the context of, of digital assets that have higher capitalizations? 
So you're, you're absolutely right. That would be another factor. One factor would be just the total capitalization, because then we can rationally assume that there will be miners who are seeking uh, the rewards, which will be equivalently large, and therefore there will be more power dedicated to the network, and therefore it will be harder to obtain the power to attack the network. But if all that power is concentrated amongst one or two participants, um, you potentially run the risk that one of those participants becomes malicious and tries to attack the network. Now, I will say uh, on this question, um, when you see reports of um, you know X Bitcoin miner has close to fifty percent or close to thirty percent, you know it looks like a big number, right? More often than not, these are so-called Bitcoin mining pool operators. In which case, they're a server that's talking to the rest of the Bitcoin network and presenting new blocks, but they've got a pool of persons working under them who they don't even know, who just dial up and talk to them over the internet, who provide them the work. And this is uh, something that these pool members want to do because it would spread out their rewards from the protocol because the pool as a whole will win blocks more often than one miner working alone, so it spreads out the income. Um, but it does mean that the pool operator potentially has the power to determine which transactions make it in blocks or don't, and in theory, the power to 51% attack. But what I'll add is when we see pool operators become large fractions of the total mining power on the network, we see the pool members leave the pool and go to other pools because they don't want to run the risk that the person that they're mining under is going to attack the network. So these economic incentives are... Uh, uh, they go both ways, and it's it's a more complicated picture than I think a lot of headlines often often depict. And I guess the second part of that question is: Are there should there be any concerns from regular standpoint in the context of separate regions? For example, there's there's definitely been talk of mining being concentrated in certain types of countries or certain regions. Is that a concern that we should take into account to, with respect to fifty one percent attack? So I I don't think it's a grave threat. Uh, particularly, uh, again, because of the, this pool issue. So you hear headlines about all the minings in China, things like this. It's, it's again, most of the dominant Chinese miners are pool operators. And so it's not necessarily this, a situation where one person is running this mining farm in China. It's a bunch of people making independent decisions. And then the other thing that's important to point out is a miner with a lot of mining power is still extremely constrained in what they can do. They can't double spend transactions unless they're able to convince somebody that the blockchain looks like X and then reorganize it by presenting the network with an alternative history. And that is something that would be very visible to the rest of the network. And you would basically be able to um, take steps to protect against that. And it's not something that could be surreptitiously done in order to corrupt the ledger. It's something that would be transparent. And then you just need to find ways to fix it, basically. That could still. Um, that could still mean that there's a bit of a mess in the short term, but it's not a sort of insurmountable challenge. And that's even under the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, a miner has extraordinarily little power. So when the network is operating as normal, um, a miner, can all they can do is validate signatures. And that's all they do do. Um, and they choose to put transactions in a block. They could potentially not put transactions in a block by systematically choosing to ignore transactions from certain participants on the network. But somebody else could pick that up, that transaction up with, with trivial ease and put it in their block. Uh, so there's a lot of redundancy built into this system, even as we move to a world with some level of mining centralization. And then the last thing I know I'm, I'm giving you a lot is that there are proposals to change exactly how, um, even in Bitcoin, this mining competition works that could really well address this issue. So part of the issue here is that the pool operator is able to choose which transactions go in a block rather than the members of the pool. There's a proposal to actually allow the members of the pool, when they provide their work, bind the pool operator to including the transactions in the block that the pool member wants included, rather than the pool operator having that power. And that would significantly um, effectively re-decentralize the power to, to choose or not choose transactions and move that power away from these centralized pool operators, while still uh, allowing the pool members to have a smoothed out rate of return on their mining activities.